which is uh, breast cancer, know your risk, and take early action. So it sounds simple enough, but it sure um, contains a lot of message because we all know that breast cancer in itself is a very common um, disease that affects women of all age group and or let me say reproductive age group, let's put it that way, and men too, of course, but majorly it is seen in women of um, reproductive age group. So uh, knowing your risk is the first step towards um, combating this, uh, this disease. So it's when you know the risks that you'd understand if and you fall within uh, the, if you fall within the people that might come down with this. And this could also help you to, you know, prevent the disease. If you have the information about what you should do. And also in terms of um, detection, if you're able to detect it, that's when you'll be able to take um, early action. And that would if affect your prognosis, you'll be able to do better. So uh, welcome again to the event. And I'll give a brief introduction of our guest speaker uh, in person of Professor Agodirin. And also um, our second speaker, Dr. Patima Dambata. <laughs> So Professor Agodirin is, um, is an excellent individual that I have had the opportunity to work with. And it was, it was a, a, really, a, a really great experience, I must say. I'm not saying that because we're in this um, platform. I'm just saying because I actually did enjoy working with him. And if I didn't, I definitely wouldn't, um, I wouldn't uh, feel um, Free, let me use that simple word to uh, contact him to do this for us. So, and um, he's, he's well known for his work uh, in, on breast cancer, especially. Uh, he's a professor of surgery and he's been uh, championing early action and progress in breast cancer management. And for the past uh, 20 years, um, he, has been he has been a steadfast warrior against breast cancer, both in Nigeria and across Africa. So his journey began as a dedicated physician, uh, witnessing firsthand the devastating impact of the disease. But, you know, as most physicians, he refused to be a mere observer, you know, of this uh, devastating disease. Uh, he became a leading figure in breast cancer management, transforming his passion into action and ensuring that women, you know, that have this disease come out victorious. So his accomplishments, over the past years, it speaks volume. You know, with over 15 years of experience as a consultant and a breast surgeon, he has guided countless uh, breast cancer patients to a successful treatment. Uh, he has had several publish publications, over 50 publications on, bre on breast cancer, which has uh, helped in eliminating early stage of the disease and contributing to the discussion and solution of breast cancer in Nigeria and across Africa. He has also a pioneered new breast surgery operative techniques for breast lung surgery and early diagnosis, treatment of breast cancer, uh, empowering women with options beyond surgical removal of their breasts. Yes. It's well known that that is one of the main concerns uh, that women usually have, you know, to have, your, um, to have the breast surgically removed. But uh, Prof is able to, you know, go beyond and empower women with options beyond just the surgical uh, removal. Uh, Professor Agodiri has also um, secured multiple research grants on breast cancer care, you know, towards um, relentlessly seeking for solutions for uh, Nigerian communities. Uh, he has um, been, over the years, inspiring uh, students, professionals, and NGOs through guest lectures. This is an example of, of such, and our technical advice uh, technical advising on breast cancer. He has also helped in, uh, he has helped in policy making. As uh, we all know, the, as we all know, the Cancer Education and Advisory Foundation of Nigeria, they have worked together with uh, the Ministry of, of Health to produce breast cancer guidelines in Nigeria that also, you know, are aimed towards ensuring that women 
with breast cancer come out successful. Professor Godwin has been touching lives, thousands of, of lives, patients with breast, uh, breast cancer, guided them through diagnosis, treatment, and recovery. He is not only a hands-on clinician and researcher, but also a visionary leader. He has convened regional breast cancer conferences on several occasions, bringing together experts mm -hmm. to share knowledge and foster collaboration in the fight against breast cancer. He currently focuses on galvanizing the community, schools, and educational and healthcare system to, to increase awareness, shatter myth, and remove stigma surrounding breast cancer, with the ultimate view to improve the survival of breast cancer patients in, in Nigeria and across Africa at large. So Professor Godwin is more than a doctor. He's a champion of hope. His tireless efforts are shattering barriers and making early detection and treatment of breast cancer a reality for women across Nigeria. Like I mentioned earlier um, in this webinar, um, you have the unique opportunity to learn from a true trailblazer. Dr. Agodurin, Professor of Surgery, Professor of uh, Breast and General Surgery, uh, will share his insights and unwavering dedication to conquering breast cancer. It's a chance to inspire, to learn, and to join the fight for a future free of this disease. So like I said, I have been opportune to, um, to be taught by Prof and to work under him. And it was an amazing experience. And today, you two, um, you would have a taste of that experience and I'm sure it's going to be an amazing one. Please, let's um, welcome Professor Suleiman Olaide Agodwin to the platform. Thank you so much, Dr. Aziz and everyone at um, the Bashir Foundation. And thank you everyone for joining for this webinar. So um, without, miss, uh, without taking much of our time, I'm going to um, introduce our second speaker in person of Dr. Fatima Dembata. Um, she's a medical doctor and an aspiring gynecologist, a cancer researcher, an avid cancer advocate and a public speaker. Um, her enthusiasm and work towards breast cancer is also well known within the community. So I'm very sure. And um, if you're familiar with the breast cancer community, especially when it comes to treatment, um, advocacy, and um, other therapeutic interventions that these patients need, you know that Dr. Fatima Dambata is a very uh, leading figure. He has a special interest in cancer awareness, community sensitization, screening, and treatment programs. Uh, she's a believer in lifestyle medicine and holistic health. Uh, she also champions several uh, causes relating to maternal child health, female empowerment, and mental health. Uh, she currently works as a medical coordinator at the Medicaid Cancer Foundation. Uh, she's a program lead of the patient access to chemotherapy program. So um, I'm sure we're going to learn um, a lot from her insights to during this webinar, and we're all happy to have her here. Uh, Dr. Fatima Dambata, welcome, welcome to the, to the platform. Uh, good evening. Uh, good, evening. Dr. 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 good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. I apologize for the noise, um, noise in my background. I'm unexpectedly caught in transit, but I hope that will not affect what we're going to achieve here today. Thank you once again for having me. Thank you and welcome. So um, starting out, um, Dr. Starting out, I'm going to, uh, Professor Godwin is going to give us his own insights, but I think I'll just briefly mention within 30 seconds that um, breast cancer awareness is a very, very important thing. Um, we, um, it's something that really needs to be out there more. You know, It shouldn't be something that we we'll do only on a specific day, which is, the, and I think it's in October, you know, where 
there's this um lots of our I think something we should do all the time every day and I personally um had experiences during uh, my stay uh, with prof where patients you know came in with this and most of them came in late and if they had detected this earlier an intervention was given earlier and they also you know go through the treatment as prescribed their story would probably be different so i really hope we would all learn from this and um, also pass the knowledge on to the people around us it doesn't just have to stay with us you know, whatever you get here you can say to your sisters your mom your aunts your cousins and ensure that everybody benefits from this so um let me welcome uh, professor suleiman alaidi agode you're welcome sir thank you um Dr. Jimon, please, can I be enabled to share my screen? Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. No, I, I'm, I'm not enabled yet. Okay, that will be sorted in a bit, sir. Okay, thank you. Kindly go ahead, sir. Okay. Is it on now? Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes. So good day, everyone. Once again, welcome to this um, webinar. I'm delighted um, to be here. So um, University of Illinois is my primary employer, and then University of Illinois Teaching Hospital also. So I give kudos to them for giving me the opportunity of practicing the trade. Um, I want to first thank the Bashir Foundation and everybody at um, the foundation for giving this opportunity. And also thank everybody for joining. Um, First, let me give a disclaimer. I speak for myself only, even though I'm an employee of the University of Bologna and University of Bologna Teaching Hospital. I'm not speaking for the organization. And these are strictly my opinion and um, understanding of the disease based on my years of research and practice and clinical practical experience. So in this segment, um, there are three segments, um, but in this segment, we'll be starting with um, understanding the breast cancer risk. Are you with me? Yes, sir, we're with you. Yes, yes. thank you. you. Thank you. So um, the questions we answer in this segment is what is breast cancer? And of course, what breast cancer is not? And why or what is the cause? And who is at risk or who has the probability of developing breast cancer? So um, let's go straight away. What is breast cancer? Um, breast cancer is an abnormal growth in the breast. Um, it, it can occur in male or female, but it's far more common in, in um, females. Um, that growth lacks control. So, so to speak, it's a form of rebel. It doesn't listen to the regular you know, control that we have for cells in the body. Now, all body parts can grow, and that is necessary for us to be able to heal. For example, you have a wound on your skin. For that wound to heal, then that skin must be able to grow. But that is a purposeful growth of the, of the skin. But contrary to that, breast cancer or cancer generally, they are purposeless, useless growths that lack control and there's no use for them really. They just trigger themselves off and start to grow. And what breast cancer does is that it takes over the breast and then it begins to spread to other parts of the body and then it destroys the breast and other parts of the body and then it sucks the energy you know from the from the from the patient sucks their blood and of course with all this it makes it a deadly disease but the good thing is that it is a curable disease if treated correctly and early but even then if it's not treated early then 
it can still be you know palliated but it can no more be cured so that is what breast cancer is okay so but let, let me say what breast cancer is not because there are so many misconceptions about breast cancer now breast cancer is not a spiritual problem it's a medical problem and um breast cancer is not an attack from an enemy or an arrow or a blow or a strike or a boil from an from an enemy these are terminologies that are often used by alternative practitioners to divert the minds of patients away from the hospital so that they can think okay this is not something i should treat in the hospital but really breast cancer is a medical disease okay and it should be sorted medically um breast cancer does not really respond to abs okay yes we say chemotherapy we use in the hospital are also form of abs but the difference is that those ones have been specially prepared to target cancer and they have been proven to have the effect and that differentiates them from what abs people try to use to cure or suppress breast cancers many of them don't work now prayers prayers are powerful and prayers work but prayers work in a different pattern and the way prayer works is that it gives hope and helps the patient cope with the disease but the patient definitely needs medical treatment and they can go pari pasu but the misconception is that people want to use one and forget the other now why should everyone know about breast cancer dr jim has mentioned some reasons and they are quite common the first thing is that breast cancer is the most common cancer in nigeria are you with me yes sir yeah breast cancer is the most common cancer in nigeria in adults male and female combined okay okay so, so now, now we have been re-entry Dr. Jimo. Jimo. From somewhere. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Sorted. So it's sorted. Thank you. So now, one out of every four cancers in adult Nigeria, whether male or female, is breast cancer. It used to be cervical cancer in the past, but now breast cancer has taken over. Not just in Nigeria, it's also taking over. That is women and these are people in the productive age actually targets them in their prime when they are productive and of course once they are removed then the whole family can be in shambles but the good thing is that it can be prevented and it can be cured and it can be treated without the patient losing their breasts okay and it can be treated without chemo if early so these are reasons why it is important for everyone to know about it not just females also men because we know men are the decision makers generally as it is in nigeria now men are the policy makers so men women everybody should know about it okay so who gets breast cancer any woman of childbearing age is at risk once a woman is fertile and once they can bear children or have born children before then they are at risk of breast cancer it also occurs in men but before we see breast cancer in one man we will have seen it in about a hundred women okay so it's far more common in women in terms of the distribution in nigeria generally in africa the age presentation is lower than in the developed countries okay about 10 decades um about a decade sorry earlier so our patients are younger than in developed countries 
generally it is read before the age of 20 years and then we have few cases coming between 20 and 29 years of age okay and then it's common quite common between 30 and 39 years of age but most cases are between 40 and 65 years of age okay and then we have fewer cases still after you know after 65 years of age so if you look at this demography you can see the target is actually the you know the population that supports the country okay the population that is in their prime these are the people that are affected now a frequently asked question is what is the cause there is only one cause of breast cancer only one only one cause irrespective of what we may find there's only one cause and that is dna damage okay so the next is that we need to explain two questions now what is dna and then what causes the damage okay i'm sure everybody knows what dna is uh um, but we tend to talk about it when we're talking about paternity disputes okay trying to know who is the, that's the common thing that we can use to remember what dna is but DNA, the full meaning is deoxyribonucleic acid. We don't even need to remember that, that full name. All we need to remember is just that it's DNA. Okay. But the important thing about it is that DNA is the instruction manual or the code of who we are. DNA determines who everyone is. And DNA is just like the blueprint of a house or the plan of a house. Um, before you build any, before you have any building, you have a plan. So that plan is already set before the house comes. And so is DNA. The DNA is set before we are even born because we inherit it from our parents. And then DNA directs all our growth. You know, is the protein that directs the body growth. And every cell in our body has it. Okay? And so... The way DNA works is that it determines who we are, it determines how tall we are, the color of our eyes, how we speak, how we walk, the growth of our body. So it all determines the growth of the breast. So the problem is that it's when the DNA that controls the growth of the breast becomes damaged. That is when we now have abnormal growth. The DNA itself has some internal mechanism of control. But those mechanisms are also damaged. Okay? And like I said, we inherit DNA from our parents before we are born. Okay? So just like we prepare the plan before we build the house, the DNA comes from the parents and are transferred in, in pregnancy to us as we grow and then we grow with it. So what causes um, DNA damage? The first thing is that we can inherit it. Okay, the damage may be from the parents, or we can acquire acquire it. That damage, okay, it can occur after we are born. That's acquired from our exposure in life. The inherited or genetic one is the one that is transferred from parents. It can come from one parent to the child. It can be from the father. It can be from the mother. But the thing is that it does not necessarily have to manifest in the parents. Okay? Because as I will explain later on, there are some check and balances. So the parent may have suppressed it. Or for one reason or the other, it is not active in the parents. Because you get some people saying, nobody in my family has it. Yes, it can occur like that. Because it can skip generations for one reason or the other. Now, the acquired effect can be due to germs, microbes that damage our tissue or cell, just like we have in um, coronavirus and all that. It can be pollutants from the environment, smoke, you know, radiation exposure and all that, heat. Or it can be due to aging. Just simply that we are aging, our body is not able to repair our damages the way it should. The body has become weak. Our defense has become weak. And so that damaged DNA can begin to, you know, propagate. Every day we walk about, 
as the ray of the sunlight hits our body, it damages some of our DNA. But we keep on repairing it. And some people have more, you know, defense, more active repair methods than the other. Okay, that's why when it comes to skin cancers, it can be more common in the albinos because they don't have that defense mechanism as the people that have melanin, deep coloration in their skin have. It's just, just to explain. And it can be due to drugs. Even drugs that are used to treat other diseases can cause damage to the DNA. And then explore to region. We can hear what is happening now in, in um, Ukraine and uh, Russia. And Russia was threatening nuclear bomb. Nuclear bomb can cause that. And there are times that America has used it in Hiroshima, Nagasaki, and all those. There was a time that um, these um, nuclear waste were deposited sometime somewhere in the east in Nigeria. I think it was during the era. I can't remember precisely. So those kind of things can also cause DNA damage. And then our lifestyle, smoking, alcohol. So all these things can cause the DNA to become damaged. But the good thing is that... Um, damage of dna is, is not the whole the whole story okay so there are some scenarios that will still happen before after the damage something like um the cancer can develop so three things can occur after a dna damage one is that that damage can just self-destruct the cell that dna that has been damaged is auto destroyed by itself or the body can suppress it and that is why you know parents that have some immunity or something can actually suppress the disease, a damaged CLA, DNA, and it doesn't appear in them. The other thing is that that DNA that is damaged can be frozen. It can freeze and no more develop for that to propagate into becoming cancer. So, and this is where, you know, other activities we do, like taking alcohol, smoking, exposure, and those can, can now push that one that is frozen. Okay, can push it forward and then it manifests as, as cancer. And then there are the aggressive ones. That once there's a damage in that cell, that, that DNA damage begins to propagate itself. It just begins to push itself forward and then until the cancer appears. Okay, so that, that is what it's about when it comes to the cause of um, um, breast cancer. Um, breast cancer. Um, the next segment is going to be about early detection, prevention, and all that. But I think the monitor needs to come in now before I continue on that. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, sir, for um, your insight on this. And I'm sure we've learned a thing or two, especially in regards to what breast cancer is not. So I think uh, a lot of people uh, confuse that, and I'm sure that must have um, been cleared that's that now. So thank you very much, sir. So next, um, we move to um, understanding uh, the risk, the common risk factors. Uh, sorry, we move to early detection and prevention strategies for, for breast cancer. Yeah. So thank you, Dr. Jimo. Yes, so in this next uh, um, section, we'll be looking at how breast cancer develops because we need to understand this to understand how it presents and to understand what we should do in order to you know prevent the disease from manifesting or if it manifests to to make sure we survive the disease and you know and this is where this will also take us into what the woman's responsibility is so um in terms of understanding the disease we first need to know about the progression okay that after a cell damage that's dna damage chromosome damage usually a cell is a small cell that is not even that is microscopic you can't even see so it's the one that has that damage in it and then it goes through several stages before it begins to manifest and there are five stages the first stage is the hidden stage there there is already a damage in that cell but it is not manifesting. You are not even seeing anything yet. That's stage zero. And then the next thing is it begins to grow, begins to appear as a small seed in the breast. And then stage two is when it extends from the breast to the armpit. Because the classical progression of breast cancer, it starts from the breast and then it goes through the armpit to other part of the body. That is the doorway. The armpit is the doorway to get out. Okay? And to spread other part of the body. And then from that 
it takes over the breast and then the armpit. Initially, it's a small thing that is just small in the breast, small in the armpit, and then it now takes over. That's the three. And then the final stage is when it's able to now spread all over the body. Okay, and all these stages have implication, which I'm going to try to explain. So I, I will shed light on the on, on that. Now let's start from the first stage, stage zero. Now at this stage, is 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 hidden. You can't see anything in the breast. The breast is totally fine. The human is totally fine. There is no symptom at all, and there is no idea that anything is happening. Okay, and this can be on for like up to seven years okay it's called the sojourn period it can be like that for up to seven years where it's gathering up just there not showing anything okay but the important thing now is that it can be detected by screening and so that is why we shout about regular screening doing mammogram doing ultrasound these ones can detect the lesion before it even appears in this stage zero and if he's able to detect at this time, we can treat the patient, you know, without chemotherapy. We can treat it without removing the breast. And then the patient can be cured. So we can see the advantage of going for screening and the advantage of picking it at this stage. Unfortunately, less than 1% of our patients present at this stage. We are at up to 50 to 80% of patients in the developed world present at this stage. And that explains the discrepancy in the outcomes that we get. Okay, at this stage also, it is cheaper to treat. Okay, and it is the best time to treat because you have a lot of options of treatment. Okay, then the next stage is stage one. At this stage, it appears as a small lump in the body, in the, in the breast. And in fact, at this stage, we can't even differentiate it from ordinary lumps. Let me say that breast cancer is not the most common problem of the breast, but it's the most dangerous problem of the breast. That's why we, we shout, it's the one that kills the patient. But there are other I mean, breast problems. So the important thing is differentiating which one is cancer from which one that is not cancer. Unfortunately, at this stage, we cannot differentiate yet, except we do some tests, except we do run some screening. By just touching or looking at it, we can't differentiate yet. Because there is no skin change, nothing at all to know that this is a cancer thing. We think it can, it can be an ordinary lump. There are no symptoms anywhere else. There are no changes on the breast. There is no pain. Okay? And But again, it can be detected by the woman if they examine themselves. Okay? Regularly. They can just detect that small lump. And then it can be detected by you know screening method come to the hospital for you know doctor to examine the breast and then or do mammogram do ultrasound okay often this stage will begin to need chemotherapy okay i will explain what chemotherapy is later on okay but we can also treat without the woman losing the breast okay and again at this stage it can be cured if we don't get the patient at stage one say zero which occurs in about less than one percent of our patients we should be able to get at this stage but because people don't come for regular screening only less than 10 percent of patients come at this stage okay then we go to stage two at this stage the cancer is beginning to step out of the doorway it is now getting to the armpit, trying to open and get out to other parts of the body and become free to spread. Okay? At that time, we'll notice a small lump in the breast still. We're noticing a small lump in the armpit. Okay? And then there's no serious pain, no, no, no pain, no skin changes also. It's still, everything still looks okay, except for those tiny, tiny lumps that we we'll see there. Okay? And then it is still difficult to differentiate, okay? But now, we as clinicians add some other things together, okay? We take the history, we look at the family history, add some other things together and begin to have, okay, a high index of suspicion. This is what an, a person that is not a clinician may not be able to do, okay? So if they are waiting for symptoms of breast cancer to appear, they may not see anything yet at this stage even. 
yet it is already you know state two okay if they examine themselves regularly they will be able to pick it because they will know what their breast looks like and they'll be able to say that there are changes here and then screening can also detect it this definitely needs chemotherapy but we can still treat without removing the breast okay and it can still be cured at this stage okay but at that stage we have we have uh, around 20 percent of our patients coming at this stage at stage two so if you look at it stage zero stage one stage two they are the early diseases and we have only about you know 30 percent of our patients coming at that stage and that explains why we have poor outcome compared to developed countries where they have up to 90 percent of their patients coming at that stage where they can be cured okay and then we now go to state three at this stage it is already advanced it has taken over the whole breast and the armpit it has opened the door wide and in fact it's probably already spreading to other parts of the body and then anybody can easily detect it at this time so when people say they are looking for early warning signs this is what they are waiting for because this is when the pain is present this is when the skin changes become obvious there is skin thickening there is deepening of the skin there is a wound there is redding of the skin of the breast this the breast becomes distorted there is darkening there is you know so all these things become obvious so and this is what people refer to as early warning sign yet is already advanced I have had quite a number of patients coming to me that yes i saw this lump but it was not cancer because i know what cancer is no it was cancer had been issue it's only that he had not developed enough so we call this symptom accumulation when you wait for the symptoms to accumulate before you now say yes it's not cancer it's been cancer all along and that is the danger of waiting for the symptoms and sign honestly i don't usually like to talk about symptoms and signs because i know that many people misunderstand it you know and they now begin to wait for what they think is early but it's late and it may not even come in the shape they want or they know fortunately unfortunately it's already advanced already it is more expensive to treat at this at this stage it is more difficult to treat it is more painful to treat okay and like i said this is what most people wait for saying they know what breast cancer looks like and then at this stage it cannot be cured irrespective of how much you spend it cannot be cured okay and that is why we always shout go for screening look for it before it's you know it's it looks for you and don't assume that because there's no family history there's nothing in your in your breast there is no pain there's no change there's nothing in that breast by estimate one out of every 15 nigerians will experience breast cancer the outcome is now depends on how, when you experience it and when you you know how you take action about it and then the next in the stage four at this stage this is the final stage it has gone free is spreading all over the body to the lungs to the liver to the brain to the bone they are they are they are actually suffering at this stage there's so much pain at this at this at this stage okay bone pains breast pain is this is when it begins to take all the they take, take all the energy this is when they appear really sick and unfortunately this is when most people now begin to see it and say i just had a sickness of just just maybe six months Meanwhile, if you look at the timeline I've given, this is probably an illness of about 10 years. But it was not detected early because there was no screening or no active surveillance to look for it. Okay, it's more expensive, more difficult to treat. Symptoms control is what we can do. Okay, and of course, when we still offer the treatment, we cannot cure. Sometimes we still remove the breast not because we want to cure the patient but because we want to take pain away because we want to take smell away because sometimes when there is now smell in that breast all the family members abandon the woman the woman becomes an outcast so sometimes we just remove that that thing to make her have a shorter life having breast cancer does not mean you should lose dignity 
You understand? So that is why we still go ahead to give aggressive treatment to make the patient have good quality of life, even though we may not be able to cure. So in summary, what I'm saying is that every woman is at risk. Every woman that can bear children or is fertile, is of childbearing age, is at risk. The stage affects the treatment significantly. There are no specific early warning signs. So we should look for it actively. We should look for it actively. I'll mention how to look for it later. And even if you think you know the symptoms, breast cancer may not give the symptom you think you know. Okay? And it may not even give any symptom until late. Thank you. So we'll be going to prevention early diagnosis, but I think um, the... Moderator will come in now again. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir, for, for that session. It was very powerful. I also, you know, being a medical doctor myself, I still learned a lot. Thank you very much, sir. So I'm sure we all know now that uh, stage zero, like Prof mentioned, is the best time to detect it, you know, so that um, to ensure optimal uh, recovery. That's when, you know, you can be rested, you can be assured of treatment. So, and we should endeavor to you know, educate people, not to think that it is an attack or you know, to think that one hub somewhere would clear this. So just go for your screening and always follow um, the instructions of your doctor. Thank, thank you once, once again, sir. So um, we move on to prevention and early... Uh, good evening. Good evening. Pete, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I deeply apologize for this interruption, but unfortunately, I might not be able to present when it's my turn. Like I said, I'm unexpectedly in transit. So if I can just have a few minutes to talk about our experiences on field, and then I would let Prof. carry on with this presentation. I am so sorry for this interruption. Yes, please, Dr. The, 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 the Jimon. Yes, sir. Okay, okay, so, um, okay, sir. So uh, we'll be welcoming uh, Dr. Fatima Gambata you know, to give us her own insights, and uh, especially in terms of the role of uh, the Medical Cancer Foundation in care of uh, patients with cancer. So, um, Dr. Fatima Gambata, you have the floor. Thank you very much, and a very good evening to you. I'm deeply sorry again for the interruption. Uh, I would like to thank Medicaid Cancer Foundation on whose platform I'm here today. So whenever I'm asked to talk about breast cancer, I like to begin with stories that I've seen and that I've experienced. And there's one particular patient whose permission, whose parents' permission I have to share her story. And I will present that today. I'll start with that. So I met her. I wouldn't say her name. She was a 28-year-old female. She had given birth about seven months before I met her, she had a seven month old baby. Now, when she gave birth and she began breastfeeding, about two months into that, she noticed that there were some lumpy feelings in her breast. When she complained to her family members, they told her that it's very normal for a breastfeeding mother to have those symptoms in her breast, that there was nothing to worry about. So she continued breastfeeding, despite the fact that she kept on feeling bleeds and so on. And then she would just go on till she finally began to have breathlessness and pain in her chest. So she decided to go to the hospital at that point. And when she was seen, she was examined, she already had a pleural effusion. Of course, not every type of breast cancer is like that. It doesn't always be that fast, but she had a very aggressive form. My first encounter with her was actually after she had the pleural fluid drained. And unfortunately, she passed away less than a year after I had that encounter with her. She was 28 years old. So I begin with this story just to let you know that cancer is not a it doesn't respect anybody. It does not care how old you are, it does not care who you are, what stage you're in, what you're doing. So, yes, there are statistics like Prof has mentioned, and that's why I'm not sharing my slide because he's. He has mentioned all of these things and he will continue to mention that the risk factors, the age that it's more common in, that it's more common in females, that not every sign or symptom that you feel in your breast is cancer. 
but the important thing, the take home message for us really is to be vigilant. And at Medicaid Cancer Foundation, we say early detection saves lives. And that is simply because if you have a lump in your breast, that is just a lump in your breast, it has not spread anywhere because that is the nature of cancer. There are cells that continue to divide, continue to exist when they should have died and allowed another cell to replace them. There is a loss of that function. And they not only continue to multiply and grow, they will have their own blood supply. So eventually they become stronger than the normal cells in the human body and they will spread. So breast cancer will spread from the breast, it will go to your lungs, it will go to your liver, it can go to your brain, so it takes over the whole organ system that is the human being. Now, if you're someone that is able to be detected at the early stage where all you have perhaps is just a lump in your breast then like prof said you might not even need to lose that breast maybe you would not even need chemotherapy that lump can be taken out it can be followed up and you'll probably be fine but if it's at the stage where it has gone to all these places then the treatment becomes much more difficult much more expensive much more physically emotionally exhausting Every day at Medicaid Cancer Foundation, I am faced with cases of cancer patients that come in at terrible stages. Unfortunately, in Nigeria, still, as much as we try to, the awareness is very, the health seeking behavior, perhaps I should put it that way, is very low. And so people try to ignore when these things start. They would rather use shea butter and keep on massaging it, hoping that the lump will disappear somehow. Or visit all the herbalists in their village before they decide to make it to the hospital. So what we see when cases worsen is that we perhaps have a foundation breast mass, or where okay, there are, but the arm is totally useless because the infodema has set in and it has traveled in advanced cases. I have so many pictures on my phone that people keep on sending to me, and they are really uh, advanced and stage terrible cases that sometimes I. As a medical practitioner, for me, of course, it's not in my hands. But as a medical practitioner, I see these cases, I already know that, okay, what we're dealing with here is just palliative care. Just make it easy for the patients to just have as much pain free days as they can till they pass away. So you can imagine how much easier it will be if we have this behavior that as a woman from age 40, you know that you cannot meet your mammogram. Every year you go, you get a mammogram so that if there is any change before it has spread, before it becomes advanced, you're finding it. Every woman should perform a self breast exam. From 16, from 15, we go to secondary schools, we tell them they are shy, they don't want to talk about it, but we make sure that we teach them. We say every month, please perform a self breast exam. There are arguments as to its benefits, but I will always be for it. Why? Because even if it will make you familiar with your breasts so that the slightest change will become noticeable for you and you can pick it even before your healthcare practitioner can pick it. Awareness, awareness, awareness. It's why we go into communities. It's why we go into schools. It's why we keep talking about it because we want the cancer to not be a god for the disease. Everybody should know that according to the World Health Organization, every individual has an 11.7% risk of having some sort of cancer. So there is nobody that is immune. There's nobody that can say, God forbid, it's not in my family, it's not in my generation. There are so many things now. He was talking about the DNA damage that occurs and he said it could be genetic or familiar, but there are so many things that we're exposed to right now that can cause DNA damage, even if it does not exist in your family. So it's for everybody to be aware, for everybody to screen. I was happy yesterday. I received the patient. I spoke to her, I, to them at their office about two years ago about breast cancer. So when she noticed nipple crack, she came into our foundation to see us. Yes, it was not cancer, but I was so happy to her that it was not cancer. But what I was more happy about was the fact that she remembered that conversation and she was able to come in because she noticed something different. We need to improve our health to think behavior. That's the only way we can beat this disease. It's too aggressive, it's moving too fast, research is going on, but if we are not actively screening and detecting these cases early, we will continue to record the high numbers that we record. We will continue to statistics where 72,000 people every year are lost to cancer. And breast cancer is the most common cancer. It takes the bulk of it. So we need to please improve this method. And it's why we need to. And we can all raise awareness at the individual level. Like you don't have to wait for Medicaid Cancer Foundation to come to your organization or wherever it is for you to know about 
for us to tell people about this you can also after hearing this today tell another person let the person tell another person let the person tell and that's how we're going to you know beat this finally i just have one thing to say and that's that we also need to you know watch our lifestyle practices in as much as screening is very important in general we need to move towards a more health conscious more healthy lifestyle so that we reduce your smoking reduce alcohol don't smoke Reduce your alcohol intake if you have to take it. Eat more food. And I'm sorry that you had to do this brief. Sorry once again for the interruption. Thank you very much, Dr. Fatima, for your inputs. Um, I quite agree with uh, what you said. I mean, uh, there are a lot of, and like Prof mentioned too earlier, that there has been a shift, at least from what it was 10 years ago, in uh, the number of cases of breast cancer and also the age distribution. So that could uh, very much be related to our, our lifestyle modification, what we eat. And yeah, I stumbled across one of uh, Prof's um, um, article, an article he wrote based on a research that was done, based on uh, micronutrients, but we'll still come back to that later. Uh, for now, um, I would uh, want uh, to indulge Prof to um, continue uh, with the lecture. Thank you, sir. Hello? Okay. Hello, sir. Yeah, can I can I go ahead now? Yeah, of course, sir. Yes, sir. You can, yes. You let can me continue. let me share my screen again. Sorry, I think I maybe I lost. Can you see my screen now? Yes, Dr. Jimon, can you see my screen? Yes, sir. We can see your screen, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. So I can go ahead now. Yes, sir. You can go ahead, sir. Yes. So um, prevention. Um, Dr. Fatima has mentioned a um, lot of things. I will just quickly recap again. Um, let me start from the maybe when when I get to the best service I mentioned. I just wanted wanted to mention that. Yes, there is controversy about it, but there are so, so many advantages um, that have been proven in different parts of the world. And it's actually generally accepted for developing countries like ours, because with breast examination, you can know your breast and you can know when there's any change. You can detect the change early and one of our studies showed that people that actually examine themselves have empowered themselves against breast cancer and they take action earlier so back to the primary prevention dr fatima had mentioned eating healthy so vegetable fruits take plenty of water these are preventions we take even before and this is useful for any cancer anyway these are preventions we take before we have any problems in the breast and it's called the primary prevention. Avoid being overweight, get active, exercise regularly because cancer actually uses excess energy in your body to grow. And cancer loves excess energy, okay, from excess stored fat or calories in your body. So burn it off. Don't let it accumulate in your body. Don't gain the weight. And take low fat diet, limit your alcohol or avoid it if you can totally quit smoking totally because smoking has been linked to a lot of a lot of cancers and other health problems don't delay pregnancy because again the shift now is for career women to delay pregnancy um there are some epidemiological risk about um, breast cancer as you delay the pregnancy to, to getting the first baby after the age of 30 that increases some risk is not a cause it only increases the chances of cancer developing in that breast and the idea is this um 
if the breast has never breastfed before, that breast has never been specialized to performing its normal function. And so that breast can easily become radicalized. But a breast that has been specialized to perform its, its, its natural function of breastfeeding has some resistance against um, breast cancer. Okay? And of course, so many people now delay pregnancy for one reason or the, or the other, maybe, you know, career and all that. So if you can, you know, then breastfeed, breastfeeding also has been proven epidemiologically to have an effect because it's, it is known that when children breastfeed, that breast again becomes more specialized for its normal function, its natural function, and becomes less resistant, more resistant to being radicalized to become cancer. And then as the baby sucks the breast, the baby is able to extract, you know, some things in the breast that may be injurious to the breast. But those things, those chemicals will not hurt the baby in the, in the, in the intestine. And so the baby is safe. It just helps the mother. And that brings the question that we know people tend to ask about, okay, men sucking their, their um, wife's breast and all that. It's only protective if there is, if there is milk, I mean, there's milk coming out. So if milk is not coming out, really, it's, it's controversial about that, the, the you know, validity of that, of that claim that we tend to see. But of course, men can help women check their breasts. And I, I know quite a number of women that they, the person that first saw the lump was the husband or the spouse. And so anything that will help to increase finding the lump early is obviously welcome. Then limit or avoid hormonal therapy. For example, you know, um, bad control pills and all those. Ones. If you can avoid them altogether, it's better to do some other forms of birth control, okay, than to use the hormones, the injection, the tablets, okay? And then perform self-breast examination. This is helpful for us. It helps you know your breast. It helps you know if there's anything going in that breast. And it helps you detect it early. So the chances of taking action also early becomes there. And so even if there's anything there that, find, that you find out, then you can survive the, the disease. Okay, and then perform mammal ultrasound yearly so now the woman should take responsibility of the breast and to take charge even before anything appears okay so they should know their breast well know the feel because when you are doing self breast examination you stand in front of the mirror you look at the mound of the breast you look at the curvature of the breast you look at the skin of the breast you look at the nipple the way it is and so you know the way the normal one is and then you visit your doctor and then your doctor tells you, okay, I've examined, this is your normal breast. And then that is the pedestal upon which you now begin to continue doing your examination. And you should do that once every month if you are from age of 20, or age of 20 years. You begin to examine your breast at least once every month. Preferably, it should be on about the fourth day to seventh day of your menses. Say you start your menses today, Sorry, are you with me, Dr. Jimon? Yes, yes I will. Yeah. yeah, say you start your menses today. You come the first day, second day, third day, fourth day. So from that fourth day, any day from that fourth day to the seventh day, you can do the self-breast examination. And it is only once in a month. If you do it too frequently, you may also miss something. Because let me explain something. For example, if you are at home, you are with your child, you are with your child for the next two, three years, you won't even know the child is growing because you are seeing the child every day. So every little small inch addition to the child's growth, you will not know because you are seeing the child every day. But if you travel for one month and you come back, you will see that, ah, my child has grown taller. So that is the, that is the idea. If you do it too frequently, that small change, that tiny, very tiny change, you may miss it. So it begins to accumulate and you begin to validate it as normal. So don't do it too frequently. It should be once in a month. And then you should get to a doctor to examine you once in a month also from the age of 30 years. Okay. And then from 30 years also begin to do breast ultrasound yearly. Okay. Now, these are, there, there are no hard and fast tools. There are no specific recommendations yet on this for Africa. But based on our own studies, we know the age of where we have most of the cancer, breast cancer in Africa. 
And we have a large number of patients also about up to, you know, 30% before the age of 30 years. That's based on the study we did on the whole of Africa. And so this is why we are coming up with this recommendation for our own patients. Okay? And then mammography, it is, that one is well proven that from the age of 40 years, we can begin to do mammography. Okay? And so from somebody that is below 30 years, just examine yourself once in a month. Once you are up to 30 years, these three, these four are, com are good for you to do, to help you. All the four together, examine once in a month, examine ultrasound mammo once in a year, go for a doctor. I mean, mammo should start from 40 years, go to a doctor to examine once in a year. Now, those are the actions you take before you find anything. And those are the responsibility of every woman. Now, what is your responsibility if you find any change at all because you should take charge of your breast and everything happening to that breast we have seen it all too well where the woman finds something and then seeks control to somebody else maybe a doctor or a friend or a nurse or somebody else and that person says go and sleep don't worry there's nothing and then it continues to go so you should check the take responsibility immediately you notice a lump seek a doctor's help seek your doctor's help everybody cannot get to a specialist but you know your doctor that you trust so seek that doctor's help within two weeks maximum now when you get to your doctor insist on some things that should be done for you don't just say doctor i have this long don't accept them so there's nothing there or just say don't worry just go you know get take antibiotics there are three things that you should do one is that that doctor should examine that breast. That's number one. Number two, they should ask for imaging. That's either ultrasound or mammal photo. Is it is that kind of photo? You know what ultrasound is? Ultrasound is what we use to monitor the, the, the fetus, the baby in pregnancy. Every human knows what ultrasound is. They used to monitor when their baby is growing. The same thing can be used to monitor the breast for anything happening in the breast. And to say this is what is in that breast, okay? And similar to, to, to mammography, is like you're saying X-ray. When you take chest X-ray, you know, it's the same thing, but it's a special kind of X-ray for, for, for the breast. So ensure the doctor does these things, and then they should add the needle test. This needle test will take a small, tiny piece of that breast, and then look at it under microscope and tell them what it is. Okay? So don't allow them to just say, see, it's just nothing. Don't worry. Just, just take antibiotics and go. And then, if they have done everything, they're a family doctor, and you are not getting, you know, the response, then you take next steps. First thing is that they must tell you what they are treating you for. You need to know. Is your right to know what they are treating you for and what is happening in the breast and when you should expect it to be resolved or to disappear, okay? Now, if it doesn't disappear within three weeks, ask that, okay, can you please refer me to a breast specialist? You don't have to see a breast specialist all the time. You don't have to see a breast specialist for anything and everything. In the, but this is, a, this is a safe way to go about it. And with this way, we know that within one month or, or one, one month or one and a half month at most, you'll have gotten to somebody that will quickly evaluate you and give you, you know, um, the best treatment. Because studies have shown that the time it, by the time you wait for two, three months, the disease could have gone from stage one to stage three within three months so that's why this timeline is very important that you know what is happening again not all the breast lesions are cancer cancer accounts for about one out of ten is not the most common but we still want to be sure of what you are treating not just accepting blind treatment okay and then the treatment now comes next i i will just there are several options of treatment are you with me dr jimo Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So there are, there are several options of treatment. And we tend to combine these, but the woman is the person that actually leads the treatment. We look at which one is best for you, and then we negotiate and say, this is the one I want and all that. And we can agree on what is best for you to get you cured. So that you will not be afraid that the doctor will just carry me and go and remove my breast. No, that's not what we do. We don't do that. But the first thing again you consider is Chemotherapy. Chemotherapy are some form of injections or, cancer or, or tablets that destroy the break cancer cells. 
They're able to go all over your body and look for cancer cells there and break them and destroy them. But the, the issue, issue with them is that they also, you know, affect part of the body. But we know the way we manage it. We know many people are afraid of chemotherapy, but we know the way you manage it to douse the effect on your normal cells and target, you know, the effect on the on the on the cells that are that are cancer and that the ones that are able in the body. Okay. And then there's hormonal therapy. This is we know breast cancer. There are some of them, and many times they actually feed on the female hormones, and that is why the hormone that makes you fertile, the hormones that makes you being to be having a breast, normal breast, the hormone that makes you grow a breast, the hormone that makes you able to 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 to, to be a mother and to carry a baby, is what the breast cancer also uses. So they feed on the hormones also. So sometimes you can target that hormone and block it and that will starve the cancer cells and then the cancer cell can shrink okay and become emaciated and that can help us to be able to remove it easily the same thing with chemo chemo also does that it makes it shrink but chemo and cancer cannot remove them completely you often need some other things to add to it now then we have what we call targeted therapy these are highly specialized and specially produced kind of cancer um, drugs they are like chemotherapy, but they are less, you know, they are less toxic on the body. And they go specifically for specific, you know, cells on the cancer to go and destroy that cancer. They block the blood vessels of the cancer and again deprive it, sort of strangulating it from getting cutting it off of blood supply, so to speak. And they are very expensive, but they are there is, you know, there is some um subsidies now on nhis some you know, foundations in nigeria also give it there's some support to get it but we need to actually know that you you are able to get this by doing some tests that will say okay this is the best kind of you know hormonal therapy chemotherapy and targeted therapy for you and then radiotherapy radiotherapy is a form of heat is a form of heat directed at the cancer cells is direct at the breast and the armpit to destroy the cancer cells because after we remove the cancer, you know, the mass, the, the lump, there may be some micro ones that have not grown to become obvious. Those are the ones the, the radiotherapy will the target. Unfortunately, we have in only a few centers in, in the country. Okay, but it is available and we can get it done for our patients. Then the next thing is surgery. Now, there are two types of surgery. The one is just to remove the lump. The other one is to remove the whole breast. Uh, so... Like I mentioned earlier on, if the patient comes early, they have the opportunity of us removing just the lump. But if we are going to do that, they need to be able to get all the other treatments. They should get radiotherapy and chemotherapy. But the main problem is that many of our patients do not have the resources to get everything. So if we don't have the resources to get everything, then the best thing will be to remove, you know, the whole breast in that wise. But then sometimes we remove the whole breast, like I said, not because we want to cure the patient, because we want to remove pain or smell or improve the quality of life. Or the breast is bleeding and bleeding and bleeding. Then we have to remove the whole breast. So there are indications for removing the whole breast and there are indications for those target targeting the small part and removing that lump, leaving the breast even the breast look i know many people are afraid of, of removing the whole breast and many people have the misconception that when you remove the breast the patient dies no the breast remover doesn't kill the patient what kills the patient is the cancer progressing because we have we, we get patients that come early we offer them the set of treatments they can't afford to have the lump removed is for them to have the breast removed then they'll go away and then they come back after about three, four years when there is so much pain, there is bleeding and there is nothing that can be done. It's already spread to other parts of the body. And so people tell them, once you remove the breast, you are going to die. And of course, we remove the breast not because we are curing, but because we want to remove pain and bleeding and suffering away. But the, the, the cancer still progresses because the cancer is the brain is still there. The one in the lung is still there. The one in the liver is still there. Those are the ones that kill the patient. And so they say they remove the breast now. Six months later, the patient died. We told you she was going to die. It's a misconception. It is not the right, it's not the real thing. The surgery is not what kills the patient. It's the disease progressing, you know, and the surgery was not meant to cure the patient. But of course, what happens when it comes to breast cancer is that when you get a patient cured, 
when you kill one patient, only the patient's family knows. In fact, there are some of them that they don't even tell their husband. You understand? Only the patient family or the patient himself knows. But when one patient dies from breast cancer, the whole community knows because of the stigma everybody hides. So when we cure somebody, that person doesn't come out. And there are so many people, so many people we have cured. No, they have five years survivor, 10 years survivor, 15 years survivor, but they don't want to be known. They don't want anybody to, 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 to know them. So that is why we need to you know, make it clear that don't misunderstand what is happening. Because that misconception actually kills more patients. So the next session is going to be on a case study that I, about cases that I've managed. But I think the monitor will also come with a comment or so here. Dr. Jima, please. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir, for, for this. Uh, it was very, very insightful. Um, I'm sure a lot of us will be, especially given the last part you know, where, where Prof mentioned uh, success stories and that a lot of us will be interested if there is actually a real um, instance where someone survived this. And I'm sure Prof would uh, give us his professional um, experience in that um, respect. All right, sir. Okay, thank you, Dr. Jima. So again, let me mention about when it comes to surviving breast cancer. Um, yes, there are people that, that we know is not, is not fiction very very well that have survived 10 years 15 years 20 years you no know, on like that but what we have is that those are people that came early and accepted the right treatment at the right time breast cancer is sort of unforgiving when it comes to you know the way it behaves if you if you start well and you end badly it is still not avoid if you start too late and you end well, it is still not okay. What is okay for breast cancer is starting well and ending well. That's where we have the best result. Yes, we are having some even advanced cases surviving five years now. When it comes to surviving breast cancer, we talk about it in terms of five years survivor, 10 years survivor, 15 years survivor, and all that. But if you look at it really, it's just like any other kind of chronic illness. People have diabetes, hypertension. They also carry it forever. So if you look at it in that light, you know, you see that the stigma that has been given to breast cancer, yes, maybe it's a very aggressive disease, but if we look at it critically and we are able to relate to the way it behaves and we're able to take the actions we do with we should, we'll have many more women and many more good stories. And if we're able to create many more survivors, then there will be no hiding for them again. That is the issue in developed countries. They have so many survivors that they cannot even hide. But we, because we have few survivors, we have only 1% coming at stage zero. We have only about 7% coming at stage one. We have only about 20% coming at stage two. These are the early stages where we can survive, where, where they can survive. So we have only very few of them surviving it. But yes, they are survivors. So I will just talk about two stories. These are real patients. I have their consent. You know, one of them really has died. The other one is still alive. But I want us to see what, you know, you know, happened and what could happen. Now, the first one is a 26-year-old um, patient. She just came with bloody nipple discharge. She didn't even feel a lump in her breast. But she had a family history of breast cancer. And then when we examined, we found a small lump. And then we found another lump in her armpit. Okay, and then we evaluated further. And then we realized that it was cancer of the breast and it was an aggressive type. But we gave her provisionally stage one. No, this 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 should be stage two now because of the lump in the in the armpit. Okay. And as after evaluation, it was now stage two. So, of course, she accepted treatment and we removed, you know, because she didn't want to have um chemotherapy and some other things, she accepted to have the breast removed. And immediately, she had reconstruction of that breast after the breast was removed. That reconstruction of the breast was made using a muscle from her back. And this is the picture. But after this treatment, um, she declined for subsequent treatment. She declined chemotherapy. And being an aggressive tumor, we couldn't clear the other micro cells elsewhere. But she opted for other treatment because she was afraid of the side effect of chemotherapy. Okay, 
And so there was nothing we could do. The family members also supported her. And she had also some support from some people that felt, okay, let her go for her party and all that. Of course, she came back with about a year later with um, appearance of the cancer again in the breast, in the brain. I started having persistent headache and all that. And then she died a year later. Now, but the, the point here is that this disease is probably an, it's an aggressive disease which we found already. Is genetically, you know, probably gen gen genetically motivated because she had a family history. We have no proof of that, but it's probably genetically. Again, when you occurs at younger age groups, it's aggressive. There is some usually some genetic, the familial components to it. <coughs> so, but she didn't accept, you know, the recommended treatment. Okay, so that is the case one. The case two is a forty-nine year old woman that had um, a painless lump in her breast, very small lump when she first saw it and uh, she just noticed it inadvertently it wasn't as if she was examining herself for anything and we know that you know sorry excuse me <coughs> up to 70 percent of our patients noted even more than 70 percent notice it inadvertently they are not looking for anything they just find it by mistake and that's not good enough and so she went to a doctor and doctor said okay it's a lump there but it's nothing don't worry about it just go just go you know there's no problem and give antibiotics and then she went away for another couple of months. And then the lump started growing bigger. And then when the lump was growing bigger, she went back and found a friend that was a nurse. And so that friend, you know, just referred her to us. And then we made the diagnosis after evaluating her that it was stage two breast cancer. But she already delayed, you know, she had already delayed. But then it was still relatively, but the, the, the tumor was now about 5 cm now, it was, it was big. So we and we had a discussion about what is the best line of treatment, and we offered her all the options. And then she wanted to preserve her breast, and she was willing to accept all other treatments, going with preserving the breast. So um, she accepted to have chemotherapy. So she had chemotherapy, okay, which shrank the tumor, and the tumor became very small. And then after that, we were able to remove the, the, the cancer for her breast, and then from the armpit. And then she again had chemotherapy to clear the remaining micro, and then she also had radiotherapy to the armpits and to the breast. Um, she is completing one year now. There's no evidence of the tumor coming back, and she's fine. Every markers we are checking has been okay. Uh, this, this just shows um, that second case. This was the incision for removing the um, lump in the breast, and then for removing the lump in the armpit. This was about a couple of days after the operation. And then this is after the radiotherapy, about, about two or so months after the radiotherapy. And so and she's doing fine. And she's on monitoring and there's no evidence of recurrence. We are going to talk about our survival after five years and then 10 years and like that. But we are hopeful that she will get it because all the markers are showing that you know she's going to she's going to do well. So again, this points to your responsibility that don't you know take responsibility for whatever don't just get blind reassurance if she had you know been assertive on knowing what is in that base at that time would have treated her maybe four months earlier okay and maybe even at an early stage maybe even stage zero or stage one at that time okay and then again this show that it's possible for us to preserve the breast and you know patients should be willing to accept the recommended you know treatment you know, it's it's um, a common thing that um, we find. Um, so let me just mention that there are some things that we shouldn't make mistakes. Are you with me? Yes, sir. So there, there are some common mistakes that people make. I just wanted to mention that here. One is that I'm not at risk. Like I said, everybody is at risk of breast cancer. One out of every 15 women has been estimated to have, will have it in Nigeria. And it doesn't matter that it's the family. Even the family may, may not appear like that. Okay, so, but just take the right steps. Don't wait for, for, for breast cancer. Do the regular screening. And don't leave your decisions. When you find something, don't leave it to a doctor or a nurse or anybody. You know, don't accept assumptions. Okay, go to them and let them give you the right treatment that you should get. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, we should just remember that breast cancer is not a is not a death sentence, and um, early detection is key. And don't troubleshoot your symptoms. If my
car has a problem, I call the mechanic. I don't drop, troubleshoot it. Don't troubleshoot your symptoms. Go to a doctor that will give you, you know, the right treatment and then ensure you take full responsibility. Thank you. Dr. Jimo. Yes, thank you very much, sir, for uh, the presentation. It was massively insightful, and I'm sure uh, we all learned uh, not just a thing or two. I know in the beginning I said we were going to learn a thing or two, but um, we've learned quite a lot from uh, the presentation. Thank you once again, sir. You're welcome. So, yeah. and, um, to add one to the list, uh, don't, don't go to Google for the symptoms, because you definitely won't get uh, the right, the right thing, the right choice. Uh, input from a participant. Uh, if you have a question, you can just post it on the. You can just text it, leave it as a message, and we'll try to uh, pick some out and read it, read it out to the prof. Uh, there are some hands up, I think, Dr. Jimo. Okay. Yes, I think we have. Um, sorry, so I, I heard that my voice was not loud enough initially. I hope I'm audible now, more audible. Yes, we can. We can hear you more. Audible. All right, thank you very much. So, and we have someone here who's asking that. Um, that there are cases of cells growing again after the surgery on the breast, does it mean surgery are not lasting solution? Okay, so I think he's trying to say that um, since correct. they are... Hello, Dr. Jima. Yes, sir. Yeah, I think... It... Go ahead, please. Yes, sir. So um, he's probably uh, thinking, since we said there are two, uh, two more seedlings uh, within the body, even after the surgery. So does that mean the surgery is not an effective method of uh, treating the disease? Yes. The, the surgery is an effective measure, me method of treating the disease. If you, if you got what I said, I said we combine a lot of treatments together. For depending on the kind of treatment, if it is stage one, stage zero, and we remove the whole breast, then there is nothing else to do for that patient and they should be cured and we know from the statistics that up to 99 percent of them are cured we never say 100 percent because we know we know that there's always that probability and everything is based on probability and everything we do is based on that okay but if it's stage one stage two they combine endotherapy with it but what we get is that many people don't complete the treatment. They don't complete their treatment. They accept a part of it. They don't complete the other part. And so we can have some micro cells that after a couple of years begin to grow. Again, like I mentioned again about, you know, like hypertension and all that, sometimes we may have it just flaring up again. Okay, but the pains are followed up and then we can still apply further treatment to the patient. Yes, Dr. Jimo. Thank you very much, sir. So we have uh, another question that is, saying, that is asking if um, ultrasound can detect cancer or just a lump. Yes. Now, um, the, the best to detect cancer of the breast is mammography at the age of 40, from the age of 40 years upwards. But there are some times that mammography also misses. And ultrasound has also been found to be effective also, especially for our own population because of the um, tissue in the breast, usually denser and they're usually younger. Yes, we have it detecting some lumps um, early. But after detecting the lump, that lump has to be taken out or biopsied, part of it taken for microscopy under the histology to confirm whether it's cancer or not. So 
And that's where the buy rats come in. The buy rats, I saw somebody asking about buy rats. Buy rats just talk about that is B I R A D S. Talks about the possibility of that kind of that lump in the breast being cancer. They say zero when there is inconclusive. They say one if it's in benign. They say two if it's probably you know not cancer. So as it grows up like that, by the time it's getting to four or five, they are saying it's likely cancer. But ultrasound cannot confirm. We still need to take part of the tissue. That's why I said triple assessment. Three tests that must be done. One, examination. Two, ultrasound or mammography or x-ray. Three, pathology. That is needle test, taking part of it. So all the three must come together. If the three of them agree that it's cancer, then they are 99.9% .9 correct. But using only one alone, you're only about 50 to 67% correct. So you don't rely on one on just one. That's why we I say don't just let the, your doctor tell you I've examined your breast is is ordinary lump. It's only about 60 to 67 percent sure of what he's talking about based on the statistics. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So um, we have another question that says that could reoccurring lump in brackets boil in different parts of the body be a sign of cancer? uh reoccurring now breast um one of the cases i've seen a very young lady is having recurring boil after pregnancy it turned out to be cancer in that one but no that is not the way breast cancer is the occurring boils is a different con usually a different thing other parts of the it's a different problem it may be due to diabetes or some other illnesses it may be due to the killing function of the defense cells in your body some people inherit some form of you know deficient you know defense or they may be all be malnourished and then they have that but that is not the sign of breast cancer but of course any boil at all in the breast when we drain it we take tissue for pathology for histology say look at this we think it's boiled but confirm for us that it is boiled thank you thank you very much sir so um, someone is asking if uh, the size is a risk factor. Huh? The, the size of a lump, a lump that is, the size of a lump is part of the staging. Is a risk factor for worsening worsening outcome if it is cancer. But the size alone is not a fact a risk factor. You can have giant lumps in the breast and they are ordinary, but again there are some of them that are giant and can transform to become cancer okay but any lump in the breast should not be left alone the only time we may leave a lump alone is if we have evaluated completely and we are sure and that lump will have been evaluated completely that it is nothing and that that person is not in the high risk group Okay, so the decision on what we take depends on a lot of factors. We look at that patient's history, we look at the family history, we look at the way the, the lump is, we examine it physically, we do ultrasound, then we do needle test, and then we put everything together, we look at the age, we put everything together before we say, okay, this is what is there. But I advise any lump in the breast beyond the age of 30 should not be allowed to stay. So this issue of size should not even come up because small one should be removed anyway, depending on you know the risk factors. But again, taking a decision will depend on the consultant, the specialist that is well informed about what is happening, and then they can take a decision on that. Like I cannot speak for all independent cases, but that's a general guide. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So I think that has uh, answered one of the questions we have here too, uh, where someone was talking about a lump. She, she did some scan which said it's beline, and then she was asking if uh, what to do next because the lump is still there. So I think uh, the question has been answered. So and someone is asking, if uh, is it safe to be doing yearly mammogram, knowing yes. that frequent exposure to X-ray may increase the risk of DNA damage? Yes, um, DNA damage, but we know that the risk of X-ray for mammo, mammo is low dose X-ray, very low dose. So it is not 
many times when I'm talking about radiation, radiation causing cancer is not usually from X3. It's not those kind of things. Those are, those are for diagnostic, you know. So when you're using it for therapeutic high dose and all those kind of things that that, that you should worry about. But it's been proven that mammo is very low dose and it is safe. Yes, thank you. Dr. Jimo. Oh, thank you, Dr. Mosa. So um, we have another question that says that she uh, weaned her child six months ago, but she's still seeing yellowish discharge from her breasts. And she's asking if she should be worried. Um, some people have lactation lasting for a longer period of time. Now, after, after breastfeeding, the breast should dry up. And uh, that may take a few weeks to a few months in some people. I've seen some people that it doesn't even completely dry up for years, but we need to evaluate. Now, some issue may be that apart from the child that has dropped handling the breast, some other persons may be handling the breast, maybe the spouse or something. And that again, once the breast is being handled, it, it will not really completely dry. Okay. So so we've seen many people like that. There are some that, you know, after some after a while, they have had it for maybe years, and then the husband travels for a couple of months, and then it dries up. So it's just the handling of the breast sometimes can be, but that, that breast should be evaluated if that is not our own normal pattern. Okay? So everything depends on the normal pattern of the individual. But there are steps to evaluating, you know, the breast. And the basic things are somebody will take your history, family history, then you go for ultrasound, or mammal or combination of the two sometimes you go as far as mri depending on what you're looking at is the more advanced kind of um photo of the breast and then if there's anything to biopsy we'll take part of it but the decision on what to do i think you can just visit a, a, a doctor that okay see i'm still having lactation despite you know stopping uh, breastfeeding for some time they may give some drugs and it may dry up but they will evaluate the breast before taking those decisions because that may be our own normal pattern some people keep on lactating even after after they have you know, stopped breastfeeding. But they would have been looked at and then to be sure that it's not a mistake. Because And the mistake that we tend to now have is that when they now see something new, they still con consider, oh, it's the previous one. No. In fact, people that have had problems in their breast before, they are at risk because they now assume that it's the same primary thing. Every time you see a new change, always talk, even if there was something there before that was said to be normal. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So we have uh, a question too relating to uh, breast abscess, which I think was incised from the description gotten from this patient. But okay. uh, she said that the uh, there's still occasional pulsating pain in the breast, which comes and goes. So and uh, she's not really able to know what triggers it. So she's asking if she should be worried about that pulsating pain after the okay. abscess has been drained. Now, the first thing about abscess is that abscess of the breast is unusual. There are some people that we expect may have abscess of the breast. But even at that, we still evaluate that breast. If you are not lactating, if it's not the first time you are lactating, abscess of the breast is not what we expect from any woman. So if there's an abscess in the breast, that abscess will be drained, and then the wall or the cavity of that abscess will be taken and looked at. Okay, especially if it is not the first time they are lactating. For women that are lactating for the first time, the inexperience can make them have you know that problem, or the way they have been handling the baby, you know, maybe they have been you know starving the baby, only putting the baby to breast when the baby cries. That way, the baby is very hungry and the baby begins to eat and you know, feed voraciously, and maybe they clean the baby's mouth and then cause some hormone in the mouth that transfers some infection to the breast. And that has to be, that has to be for the first time. Otherwise, we don't, we, we don't take it lightly. Even at the first time, we also still take biopsy. Now, so I, so I think biopsy, biopsy will have been done to get that information. Now, when, when now, one now feels pulsating pain in the breast, it is not a common, it is not a common side of, um, um, finding of breast cancer but it can be especially if it's a particular point so what can be done in that instance is that, that breast will be evaluated that particular point will be noted and that particular point can be called out 
for investigation. Okay, there are special ways of actually doing that. But again, that person needs to see. Hello, are you with me? Yes, sir. Again, that person needs to see a specialist that will evaluate the breast and say, okay, this is a problem with it. It's difficult to say. You know, there are so many, like I said, there are so many factors we put together for making a decision on, on each breast. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So um, there's a, a question on concerns uh, regarding chemotherapy. That can you shed more light on the side effects and why people seem to be uh, scared of chemo? Yes, um, chemotherapy is, um, like I said, a toxic drug, and the effect is to be toxic on the cancer cells and to kill the cancer cells. Now, but unfortunately, some of them are not that, you know, you know, they don't pick out the cancer cells well. Most of the chemotherapy don't pick it well. Some are milder, some are more direct to where they, where they are supposed to act. And so the patient can have various side effects. Some people have darkening of their skin, they have um, vomiting, they, they lose weight. Um, then some of them, the menses may stop, okay? Um, because it's, the chemotherapy affects any rapidly developing cells or dividing cells and can affect the ovary also. But of course, there are things that can be done. I've seen patients that have had chemotherapy and they have not had any of these symptoms and they are even growing, they eat more, they become fresher, so we don't know each patient has a way of, of, of you know reacting to it, but that is by far the most way most patients react is those side effects. And so people are afraid of those side effects. They lose their hair and all that, their skin becomes darker. So they are worried about the way they look. They will not be able to eat well. But there are things that we do that mitigate all this and make it, a, a, the patient able to tolerate the cancer. And the effect is just for a short period of time. Now, there are various ways if one is afraid of, you know, the mens is going because if the mens is good, then they may not be able to conceive in the future. There are ways we can actually bank the eggs for the woman if they are, you know, you know, they are able to do that. There are facilities in Lorraine for that. There are facilities for in Nigeria for that to bank the eggs. Okay, but each person will be, you know, looked at independently, and then we can look at ways to make it lighter on them. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So there's a question uh, about that. Uh, can small can a woman with a very small breast be affected by breast cancer? Yes, it, does, it doesn't matter the size of the breast. Okay, it sir. doesn't matter the size of the breast. Okay, thank you very much, sir. So there's all, uh, also a question that says that uh, is it true that breastfeeding slash sucking reduces the risk of breast cancer? Yes, I mentioned that earlier on. There are some epidemiological fact is a weak fact that when baby sucks when the baby sucks they suck out you know um the some chemicals they also help the breast to become more specialized for its function and the more specialized breast is more resistant to be radicalized to become cancer um, a study has been done before among some people those that that community they only breastfeed one side and they now we now what was found is that in that community, it's not Nigeria, it's some, somewhere in Asia, in that community, their own breast cancer was more on the other side where they were not breastfeeding from. And that was contrary contrary to the whole world pattern. Okay, and again, there is also some evidence that you know those sucking out those organochlorides, those chemicals from the breast can 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 help. Thank you very much, sir. And the longer one breastfeeds, the, the more the, 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 the potential accumulates. So, for example, if you have five children, and the potential will be if you have breastfed each one for two years, that potential is accumulating, you know, over that over that 10 years, as against if you have only breastfed for six months. But again, it is not a cause. Not breastfeeding is not a cause of breast cancer. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So um, this, I think this should be our last question. Okay, one just dropped in. So let's say um, two questions, two more questions to go and we round it up for a day. We've been here for quite a long time. So um, there's someone here saying that uh, she's been having discharge on both breasts uh, since July last year, and it has been persistent, especially when, she's goes, when she goes through no stress. 
So she wants to know about that, if it's something to worry about. Yes. Um, number one, breast cancer discharge is not likely to be on both sides. So what she has is likely to be a systemic problem, not breast cancer. Most likely not because it is, you know, on both sides. But there is no never because sometimes you can have the two breasts having cancer at the same time or almost at the same time. So it's still important for her to have adequate evaluation. There again, we put all the factors together to decide. But for most for most times, breast cancer is not once there's is is on the two sides. It's something related to a systemic thing, something inside the blood, maybe the hormones or something is causing is causing that. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So to the final question for the day, um, the patient, the, the person is asking um, or is saying that she always um, have this experience where her breast gets big and hard uh, whenever she's breastfeeding. And she's had three kids now. She had the same experience with, the, uh, with all her children. And uh, she's afraid that if it may lead to breast cancer. OK. Now, if, if it's something that appears and goes away, it's not likely to be breast cancer. Breast cancer is a progressive thing. It does not appear and go away without anybody taking action. It doesn't disappear by itself. So if it's something that appears when she's breastfeeding, it may be just a milk sac in the breast that is overfilled. It's possible that one of the sacs is blocked and then it doesn't empty well and causes that thing. Okay, but I expect that when she had the problem, she could have been evaluated for, for it at that time. If she has not been evaluated for it, it's still best for her to go for evaluation. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. So um, that will be the last question for the day. Um, we thank everyone for taking our time to be at uh, this um, event. And uh, I hope we've all picked Dr. Jima, we have lost you. Or am I the one? Yeah, it seems to have gone off, sir. Dr. Jima, are you here with us? Um, not a bad sentence. So? Your network went off a bit, Dr. Jima. Can you? Oh, guess? okay. So thank you once again for um, coming. And um, we uh, give a special uh, thanks to uh, Professor Suleiman Oleda Godering for taking our time to put up such wonderful presentation and also taking our time to be here today to uh, teach us on all of this and educate us on um, breast cancer. Thank you very much, sir. You're yeah, welcome. It's my pleasure. Any day. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um. So, um, IBK, um, is there anything you'd want to add? Yeah, yes, to yes, sir. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. We appreciate your time. We, um, we appreciate all the powerful, you know, presentation you have given to every one of us today. We've learned a lot. 100%. We appreciate you on behalf of the entire management of Bashir Foundation for Fistula and Women's Health. We appreciate your time, sir. And, uh, you know, we thank you. And also, we want to thank everyone that are thinking now their weekend time also to come and listen to Prof. I hope, you know, every one of us here has gained one or two. And I hope we are going to be a great ambassador of women's health. And I hope you'll be able to speak with the next you know, next woman around you, your friend, your sister, your mother, speak with everyone. Please spread the awareness. This, this, this remains, you know, a very vital and a very disastrous disease in our society. And, you know, we wish by God's grace we're going to, you know, have more women for occasions like this. So um, this is not a one-time thing. And we're going to be having more programs like this for women's health. 
Uh, please, everyone, stay tuned on our group chat. We're going to be communicating, you know, more topic and everything. And also, we're going to share with you, you know, a form on the group chat. Please, if you have not joined the group chat, please check the chat and join the group chat right away. Because we're going to be doing a quick survey on what kind of topic you'd like to hear from us next. We are going to bring, you know, more, you know, more powerful and, you know, experienced like proof that can come to uh, as is please let me drop the link on the you know on the chat here so everybody can join okay. please link to the group chat please join the group chat this is this is going to be a quarterly program by march we are going to come back here again we are going to have a powerful awareness program for women's health precisely strictly women's health and you know bring them to your you know to your to your to your awareness and please, if you have not followed us yet, follow us on follow us on Instagram, follow us on Twitter at Bashir Fristula. Follow us everywhere so we can be able to catch up with all our latest news and updates and all. Okay, someone is saying cervical cancer. No problem. We're going to just join the group chat. We're going to drop a send a survey right now. Uh, Doctor uh, Doctor Aziz, please kindly drop. You know. A, a, a survey we're going to drop a survey on the group chat right away so we can be able to capture you know what topic and you can also drop it here on the on the chat whatever topic you want us to cover next you can drop it here on the chat we're going to take note of them so thank you everyone once again thank you for your time we hope we have been able to impact knowledge and um see you next time a god grace match we'll be here with you again thank you so much thank you everyone See you. Yeah, thank you, sir. So, um, would uh, would discuss thank you so the other much, part sir. of this, sir. I would call now. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.